All right, so our next speaker in this session is Ben Ward. So I will give the stage to him. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you, everyone, for coming to listen to me talk this afternoon. It's my first JulioCon, and I'm uh, having a blast meeting everyone that I've only seen until now online, basically. Um, so I'm going to be talking about the BioJulio project um, this afternoon and um, what we've been doing and where we're going to be going. Um, so um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Ben Ward. Um, I'm an evolutionary biologist turned um, bioinformatician. I work at the Earlham Institute, which is this rather attractive red brick building down here. Um, and it's part of the larger Norwich Research Park. And you can see the University of East Anglia in the background. Um, we provide a national capability in sequencing for the UK. So we're a, um, a, a British government funded um, research institute that has um, sequencing capability for um, other projects funded by the BBSRC. And we have loads of really interesting pieces of kit like the 10X and the PacBio and um, machines like that that are enable us to put together complex genomes. Um, the one um, it, fun fact I have about Norwich is that, uh, Norfolk in general, is that somebody once told me it's the place where ambition comes to die. Um, <laughs> because people are so happy there and it, it's been rated in um, people who rank these things, you know, like happiest countries or whatever, um, as one of the places most popular in England to settle down and raise a family. So. There we are. Um, so th what I want to talk about this afternoon is not necessarily a tutorial or workshop or an in-depth demonstration of BioJulia code, um, nor is it a strict chronology of who did what and when, because that would be far too tedious and impossible. I mean, if, you, if you're that you know, interested, go and look at the Git logs. Um, but what I want to do is characterize the achievements of BioJulia development in the past up to the present. Um, characterize where we are now and then where we might go into the future. Um, so if I were to characterize the past, well, I first started um, getting interested in Julia way back when it appeared um, at version 0.2, maybe 0.3. Um, and at that time, there were only a few packages around. Phylogenetics, which was mine, and it was woefully ill-equipped and is still like that to this day. Um, BioSeq, which I think was the sequencing packages first developed by, I think it was Diego, who's in the back there somewhere, um, and FASTER.io, um, which is like an I.O. library for a certain format of file. I have no idea who made that, so I can only apologize. Um, if I had to characterize, and we all got together and started the BioJulia project. Um, since then, I would characterize the project development has um, several different pushes or efforts to make bioinformatics much more pleasant as a discipline. Um, and what do I mean by that? Well, if you were to look at pipelines of um, bioinformatics um, analyses, you'd see something like this, where you start with um, doing some DNA sequencing on a sequence, so you get some raw reads from that, which is sort of short pieces of sequence you would try and put together a whole genome or map those short reads to an existing genome, do local realignments, and then try and um, quantify the genetic variation and characterize it. And then only at the bottom do you actually get to look at the biologically interesting stuff, um, which is the whole point of your project, look at gene networks or pathways and so on. Um, and because of this nature of working, every single one of those steps almost has a, a, a set of tools which all have their own set of file formats. And it's very, very difficult to pull all those things together and work with them in a way that doesn't make you want to pull your hair out. Um, so we're littered with file formats. And so there are multiple efforts to try and standardize things, but it never quite works out that way. Um, to be fair, loads of the formats try and optimize a certain bioinformatic task or they achieve some goal. But you know, everyone wants to be the one standard that rules them all. So. When you want to try out somebody's bioinformatic method that you read in the paper, things are never quite as simple as they at first appear. Um, so how did we go about trying to fix it? Well, here's some examples first of some of the file formats for those of you who aren't um, into sort of the high throughput sequencing stuff. Um, at the top, you have like a reference sequence, and you've done one of these alignments where you align the shorter sequences to it. That kind of information is stored in a file that looks like the bottom text file where every row is a record of an alignment. 
Um, that's called the SAM format. It has a binary version called a BAM format, and it's not the only format that stores alignments. Um, and it has its own set of tools. This is a VCF format. It stores mutation data. Um, and again, it's not the only format or tool set for working with mutation data. There are many others, such as the Plink format. Um, again, every single row is char characterizes one mutation in one place in the genome. Um, this is a very simple format. It's the FASTA format. It's used to just store sequences in the text file. And it's not the only way to store text files and work with text uh, um, uh, sequence files. So we all have these different tool sets related to different formats, and we have to pipe them all together to do some sort of work. So I've, I've blocked out identities here to protect the innocent. Um, but there's a Twitter question. Given a .bam file and a .bed file, so given a set of alignments and a file containing a set of um, features in a genome, so this might be the locations of genes and, or so on, how do you get the parts of the B region, the alignments, uh, no, how do you get the um, uh, regions in the genome that are not covered by the reads? It's a fairly simple question. Um, and in order to do it, you have to use some bed tools, which has some command line with a flag. Um, and you pass in your files, and you have to pass that into a little awk one-liner and pass that into another command. Um, the problem is really the sometimes gluing together things in the middle, like with grep and orc and so on, um, because those lines are very format specific. This is a very generic job you want to do. I have a set of ranges in one um, data set and a set of ranges in another. I want to find the places where they don't overlap. The command shouldn't be dominated by the format. If suddenly you're not dealing with um, a bed file anymore or um, a BAM file, will that orc line in the middle work? I don't know and somebody else downloading and using or trying to copy your pipeline might have some slightly different data and it may not work for them. So how did we go about um, fixing this? First, we had to f come up with a way of dealing with inconsistent file formats and their parsers. Um, a lot of these text formats have a certain amount of definition, but some of the formats are almost deliberately poorly defined in areas to allow flexibility in the future, because this is science. Um, so we have to deal with all these different kinds of records so, and deal with them and pass them in a way that's consistent. So how did we do this? Um, well, well, first I'll show you an example. This is not a bioinformatics format. This is, um, if you might remember um, Dan Jones' talk, this is um, character art of a pizza. <laughs> um, and yet some bioinformatics tools like CTK will perfectly accept it and do something and print it out, <laughs> right? So loads of passes are non-validating because the formats are flexible. It's very hard to validate something that is flexible. But this pass is used 1,615 times on GitHub. So Dan Jones came up with a solution. We're going to use um, a, um, a finite state automaton based on a regular grammar where we describe the grammar of a format. And we use um, Regal to generate passes that generate the code, um, to generate the Julia code for us. The resulting passes were fast. Go to his talk in 2015 for more information about this in detail. Um, but it's faster than Bioconductor and C++ and some of the passes that we ran that we created using this infrastructure even faster than like SAM tools and all the ones that biologists consider their go-to. Um, sadly, um, Regal was a separate dependency and a completely separate compilation step. Um, the Regal maintainers at some point decided we're not going to support anything anymore other than C and C++. So for a while, we had to support um, a fork of Regal that, was, that would generate um, Julia code. So um, Ken Tosato, who is a, a, a GSOC project, uh, a GSOC student for the project, um, decided to write an FSM generator package called Automa, where um, in the interest of time, I won't show you any, any code um, that it looks like, but if we have time at the end or people are interested, I can show you how we've used Automa to code these things. Basically, you can define your grammar in Julia, um, attach arbitrary um, pieces of Julia code to action names, and then at various points as your um, regular state um, machine 
parses the file and goes through different states, those Julia um, code statements get executed, and that's how we generate our parses. So, and those things are fast. Um, um, Kent has um, included in the package various um, contexts for the state machine, so you can do a very simple one, which is just based, dispatches the code base, um, it's based on uh, dictionaries, and so that's not very fast, but um, in production you can, it, it unrolls all the for loops, for example, and generates like a whole unreadable mess of go-to code, but it works um, because it conforms to the grammar and it's fast. Um, that alone, though, isn't enough because we still have this problem of, yeah, but there are loads of different formats, so how do you wrangle them all together? Um, well, most of these formats have something in common, and that is that you can think of them as a stream of records. Every line is a record um, describing some something. Um, and so we created APIs um, that define consistent reader and writer behavior. So here, um, I'm opening a FASTA reader, which reads FASTA files. I'm looping over every element in the reader, so every sequence in the FASTA file, and I'm doing something at the end. I'm closing it. And the thing is, this code is exactly the same no matter the file format. You could take out FASTA reader and put in BAM reader. It doesn't matter. Um, so there's none of this like massive swathe of tools for different formats that you have to use anymore. Um, and the same for writing something. If I want to write out my stupidly simple DNA sequence, I can stick it in a fast day record, open the fast day writer, write the record and close it. Um, and we have a core um, package called BioCore, which has many, many um, method names, um, which um, sort of define the core API. Um, so there are a set of functions such as distance or sequence name, sequence, left position, right position, and now, whenever you want to do anything with any file format, if that type of record supports that concept, then you can just use those methods and you don't have to worry about the format anymore. Um, so here's an example. Um, I've got some code here where I have a set of names of sequences I want from a sequence file. I open my FASTA um, reader. I filter um, using the filter, uh, the filter iterator to basically filter out from that file only those sequences with that name. And the thing is, again, the important thing is this code will work no matter what the reader, as long as it's a reader for some file format that supports sequences that are named, so that could be fast A, fast Q, two bit format, whatever, doesn't matter, that code is the same. So biologists can now script and create general functions for just working with a data set. Here the, the action is important, not the format. So the biologist wants is thinking more about what they're doing rather than what their files look like. Um, here's an example of how you would do in BioJulia what um, you do in um, that Twitter question. So I have um, some genes in a GFF3 file that I'm opening a reader and using the collect function on to sort of load them all into memory. Then I'm filtering for a certain feature. Then I'm opening an, alam an alignment file, which is a BAM file and then I'm just going over them and finding the overlaps. So now he does know, you know, oh, this tool, this tool with this command first, then pipe it through this orc command, and then, no, it's all in Julia, and it's all um, perfectly human readable and very, very semantic. And again, any of those file formats change, doesn't matter. Um, so achievement two, I would say is um, we define consistent data types and algorithms. So my favorite is um, the sequence data types um, because that's what I spend most of my time working with. Um, we created specialized sequence types. Um, so here we use, make use of Julia's um, parametric um, types to create one data type that has the same structure but different behavior based on the alphabet. So is this a protein sequence, a DNA sequence? How compressed is the DNA sequence? Is it an RNA sequence? Um, and we have encode and decode methods that dispatch on the alphabet to control the internal behavior. And then, um, so that, uh, there's an example of some of the encoding for DNA sequences. You can either encode a nucleotide with four bits or two bits, depending on whether you have ambiguities in your sequence. Um, that allows for fast operations, but we all accept Julia's fast now, so that's not really the point. The point is, there are also other sequence types like KMAs, which are primitive types. 
And again, they behave exactly the same as all the other sequence types. So again, everything behaves consistently. This is the important thing, I think, for bioinformatics. Um, achievement three, I would say, um, I've been, is in progress, and I I'm, I'm spend a lot of time trying to um, make all the packages consistent in their layout and what people can expect. Um, so people know, is this package experimental? Is it stable? Can I use it in my project? Or will it, will the API break in the next release? Who's responsible for it? Um, so I've been, so I, I copied an idea actually from um, the Tidyverse guys and our studio by, by adding um, package lifecycle badges to all of our projects. Um, and descriptions of those in, will appear in the contributing files for the project. Um, and the packages now all have a set of consistent um, uh, project files that describe how to contribute, the code of conduct, the humans MD, which is the humans responsible for the project, um, and a set of um, templates for dealing with GitHub. So um, we have checklists and a standardized way of filing out contributions or issues. So, so biologists shouldn't um, have a lot of guidance in interacting with us. Um, so today, we have a consistently presented set of packages with consistent APIs that allow you to script most simple high throughput sequencing tasks, as well as develop prototype algorithms um, and define types and methods that extend those APIs as they are currently as well. Um, BioJulia is back, but now it's more or less a, a, a meta package that basically just binds together a load of um, other packages because we have to split our ecosystem into many smaller packages, a bit like Chris did, has done with um, um, the differential equation ecosystem and um, tie many components together in a consistent way. Um, so where do we go from here? Well, one of the things I want to talk about here are improving methods in genomics. We've improved the current working practices in BioJulia to a certain amount with our API design. I want to improve methods in, in genomics. Um, so some of this is based on what I'm doing in the Clavijo group at um, Earlham Institute, and loads of this is going to start making its way into, um, into um, BioJulia soon, um, and it will require some new packages and updates to our current ones. So currently, you can describe how most bioinformatics is done as a kind of hierarchical stacking. You, you have a genome, and then that one genome is privileged above all others because we align all the reads and, uh, and call variants against that reference, and then we stack up the analyses. That kind of way of working is very fast to produce, starts looking great, but it can be opaque, and critically, it forces reference bias um, and the lock-in factor for tools and formats that's difficult to evolve. Um, what we want to move to is on a kind of um, way of working on the right-hand side where you have many, many genomes that are produced de novo, um, which is easier to do now thanks to the falling cost for sequencing. Um, and in which you have many, many genomes um, that are all brought together um, to build informative models for certain biological applications. Um, one example of um, the reference bias is um, I'm working on the tiger moth at the minute um, where um, a group in Cambridge are looking at a, a trait which they think inherits in a Mendelian fashion, which m should mean they should be able to map to a location in the genome and find a gene or, or um, a few genes that control that trait. They've tried mapping and they can't find it anywhere. So we're using our methods um, to try and find the variation. And I can tell you using um, our methods, um, I'm finding lots of variation between the two different um, phenotypic groups of this moth that are not present in, you can't represent the diversity that's there in a clapped representation of the genome where you only treat one genome as the canonical. Um, so we treat the gr genome graph that's output by the assembler as as the genome, and this is a, a visualization of the E. coli genome. Um, and what it is is, with a, a linear reference genome stored in, say, the FASTA format, if you have, say, a diploid, um, what you have to do is you try and collapse the entire sequence into one linear, uh, the entire genome into one linear sequence. Um, and if you have heterozygosity here, which is like an area where the two copies of the um, uh, chromosomes in the genome differ, well, maybe your assembly will spit out an alternative FASTA file, but often it will just collapse it. Um, whereas in, the, in a genome graph, it's represented as a bubble. 
and the same for repetitive regions or complex regions, um, the graph retains all that information, whereas if you force a single reference um, genome that you then align stuff to, you lose all of that information. Um, and and, and um, using um, genome graphs, we've been looking at um, threading reads and reference genomes through these graphs and what you can do, you can recover, um, you can like thread genes through these graphs like here and you can recover places um, you can look, recover the locations of genes much better than you can in a, in a um, collapsed linear reference because even if an area of the graph is incredibly messy, you can still worm the gene through and like find the path through the graph that, where that gene is located. Um, so that's all I have to say about that um, given the time, but if anybody's interested in, in graph-based um, assembly methods or, or um, graph-based analysis of genomes, I'm, I'm happy to talk about that a bit more. Um, but for BioJulia, I think um, now that we've hit uh, version one um, and the APIs are stabilizing, we can start focusing on um, the user experience a lot more. Um, and there's, a lot of, there's lots to do here with plenty of opportunity for collaboration and contribution um, because especially um, sort of interacting with IPython notebooks and um, um, plotting because graphics is an area that we've largely neglected up until now because we wanted stuff to be, you know, really nice APIs, really fast, and that sort of thing. Um, so here, and I'm really encouraged at this conference to see, like, in the Queryverse talks and stuff, like, um, the, the data Voyager thing that pops up where you can just create an electron window in Julia now and just add widgets and things. That's incredible. Um, so what I'd like to start, to, here's an example. I've taken, um, um, so this is something that Dan Jones experimented with a long time ago, um, getting an embeddable, um, genome viewer um, running from inside uh, Jupyter. The difference is, and this time I've updated it to the current BioJudy APIs, and um, unlike last time, Dan Jones ran this on, a, on a, a server in the background that fed data to the browser. Here the data is completely in line. There's nothing running in the background. This is just static slides. Um, but I think taking these sorts of components already exist actually because there are various biological visualization projects out there and wrapping them up into Julia so we can just like go widget and just make it pop up in a window is going to be like a real user, like a killer user feature that doesn't really exist in any other um, like high level projects out there in like Python and so on. Um, so that's it's taken control of, there we go. Um, so now we're also at 1.1, we can start getting into infrastructure and making tutorials. So um, there's an there's a infrastructure project um, at my institute, um, like a big collaboration with um, some folks in America called Cyverse, and they have like a discovery environment, which is like, um, it's kind of like Galaxy really, but you, you, you put together your pipelines and you execute stuff on the cloud, and there's like this whole shared cloud infrastructure, so it really empowers biologists who don't have HPC compute um, resources at their disposal. Um, we should get um, BioJulia um, packages and infrastructure packaged up into Singularity. Um, and I've been talking with the Julia computing um, people that, at this conference about getting some of the packages into Julia Box and start doing tutorials on, um, like tutorial videos and maybe putting those up on Julia Academy or the YouTube channels and things like that. Um, which is now, you know, we should really push for this now that um, the APIs are stable and are going to be stable now that Julia's at 1.0. Um, it's also a good time, I think, because I can tell from my personal experience, the last three years or so, the response has been, oh, I'm, not, I'm not using that, a new language, are you crazy? Now, um, or are you wasting your time? Now, even in my own group, um, it's like, there'll be some frustration with their current tool and they'll go, God damn it, Blast isn't doing this really simple thing I want it to do. And then they'll turn to me and go, Ben, is there any chance that in BioJulia there's that? And I go, yes, there is. Um, <laughs> so now people are starting to go, well, okay, now I'm going to try it. And people are actually bothering to, um, and I've um, got, thank you, I've got emails, um, like the number of emails from people even at my own institute or people saying, hey, I downloaded this package, but this part, doesn't work, I mean, the, the fact that it doesn't work because there's a bug isn't great, but the fact they downloaded it and can tell me that, whereas before it was just complete indifference, um, is 
great. So I think this is this is Julia time now for bioinformatics. Like we get let's get going. It's 1.0, and people um, should uh, should start to um, use Julia a lot more. And they'll see they'll see that this is a better way of working. Um, recently, I, I've been collect I. I've been experimenting with um, getting BioJulia an open collective profile. Um, need some tinkering to add members and stuff. So at the minute, I think it's only me on there. Um, but it's over at this link. Um, I'd like to work towards BioJulia being able to. Oh, every time I close the laptop, the Wi-Fi dies. Um, but anyway, um, I'd like to start to work towards BioJulia being able to rely on maybe our own infrastructure if possible for certain like server tasks and automation and stuff because it's quite a job to manage many, many packages. Um, currently, we rely on the good grace of company generosity like GitHub, Travis, and so on. And that's absolutely fine, but you know, the sort of free versions of things sometimes aren't that convenient for larger projects. One of the big motivations for breaking up BioJL into a whole ecosystem of smaller packages is that Travis just can't handle it. Um, so it would be nice to, to be able to um, spend some money on some infrastructure if we can get it. Um, but I know Chris is turning um, DiffEQ into a non-focus organization, which I spoke to him about but that, briefly. That doesn't get you CID sources. No, no, no. <laughs> no. But um, taking BioJulia and turning it into something a bit more than just a group of people on GitHub is something I'm very interested in doing. Unfortunately, I don't understand organizations or foundations or any of that stuff, so um, I'm, I have to be open to, to comments on that one. Um, um, so I've got three minutes left. Um, there's not too much I want to say now without sort of poking or prodding in various directions, but other than to thank everybody in um, by Julie who's contributed over the years, um, Dan, Kent, uh, Richard, Diego, Joe, um, uh, Scott Jones. Um, Scott Jones isn't even a biologist, and yet he's really great to talk to about performance of algorithms and things. Um, my group at um, LM Institute, um, especially Bernardo, thanks for the employment. Um, <laughs> um, and, and changing how I see data analysis. Um, and then um, to my previous sort of supervisors, Federica de Palma and um, Cock Van Oosterhout um, from the UEA, who uh, funded me f my tinkerings in Julia for, for you know, sequence analysis for about a year. And mostly thank you to all of you for A, the awesome language, and then um, B, the community, C, all the packages, and uh, D, Julia Kong. So I'm having an absolute blast. So thank you. Questions? Yeah, uh, two things. Well, first of all, you mentioned that you could talk more about how you're doing the omics graphs and uh, basic, any visualizations on that. So if you could show, if you had the slides for that, if you could go through that, that would be great. So yeah. the, the genome graphs? Yeah. Um, so the visualization actually isn't ours. Um, I'm going to go back to the E. coli. Um, nope, that's too far. Somebody else complained um, about how this is not linear, um, <laughs> unlike PowerPoint. Okay, so this visualization, we don't do much on visualization at all. This is um, a screenshot from um, a program called Bandage. Um, that's an OSX um, desktop app um, that somebody um, put together. And what it does is it visualizes um, uh, a What's the file format called? A GFA. Um, so uh, it's called Graphical Fragment Assembly. Um, and what it, it, it opens up in a, in a whole interface. And it, the layout algorithm is not especially great, especially with complex genomes, I can tell you, because you have to go in and like drag and drop things and pull things apart. Um, but it allows you to do loads of like cool stuff, like load in sequences and do blast again, do like a blast alignment search against the graph and that sort of thing. Um, so we don't do that, what we're working on right now, so the, the motto of our group is um, understand, uh, tackling complexity through simple and significant properties. So um, a lot of um, our work at the moment, we're building a set of, it's in C++ at the minute, so booth, but um, 
um, a set of um, tools and a representation for graphs that allows us to, um, for example, incorporate information from some of the more modern sequencing technologies like um, PacBio and 10X. And, mm -hmm. um, so we don't necessarily do so much on the visualization side. I'd like to as part of Biojulian because there are other people interested in graphs as well so we can like benefit from each other's efforts. Um, one of the things I think would help for visualization with this kind of thing is um, some of the um, problems with genome graphs you can reduce to um, like a local area. So one of the f um, um, algorithms that without going too much into it, like the phasing algorithm basically um, that we're working on, say we, Bernardo basically, is working on, um, takes two nodes that have a certain, um, it's, there's like a metric that says these two nodes are unique. And basically, you enumerate all the paths through those two. And then um, there's a load of stats that are computed, and it's basically a flow problem. And visualizing something like that, where you have a, a defined region of interest that you're analyzing, that kind of thing is a lot easier to visualize than, I mean, that's E. coli. So, I mean, we've done stuff, we've put together the, um, the, the group has put together the um, bread wheat genome for most recently, and that's huge. Like visualizing that is mm -hmm. 20 minutes to even render. Like. Mm -hmm. um, so, so yeah, then the other thing I wanted to ask was um, a lot of the people in the DIFFIQ area are very interested in simulating biological organisms. And now as things are getting more and more real, we're wondering um, what kind of, uh, do you have anything on like the data generation side so, so that we can put our numbers into these uh, kind of file formats and then actually have these, uh, our simulation, d simulated data then go through the same pipelines that bioinformatics are using so that way we can, you know, kind of test the, the methods at a deeper level. That, I've thought about it before and actually in the field I was in before sort of bioinformatics, population genetics, is very, very theoretical and heavily based on simulation. Um, my attitude in the current position, I mean, with genomics is that we basically, and this one I inherited from my boss, is that we only work on real data because the simulations are just, they don't capture like the full extent of biological complexity that's out there in, in terms of these algorithms. Like there are papers that go, look, we made a brand new assembler, it's fantastic, and here it is tested on a load of simulated data. And it's like, well, what good's that really? Um, because you then go and apply it to some real genome and then it fails. So it's, it's really, really difficult um, trying to capture the complexity in something like a complex genome. Mm -hmm. So it's like we, we, just, we just use the real at the moment. Um, but at the same time, like I say, I, I was in population genetics where doing simulations was something you really did a lot. So I, I see the utility in doing it. Um, with, the, with the genomic stuff, I'm, I'm not so sure that, there's, that it's a good idea. But with other biological applications, I'm, I'm sure that we Yeah, we're not that. sure if it's a good idea, but that's why we want to try it. But we, we could talk at the hackathon about this. Okay. There we go. Other questions? Oh, yeah. So there's quite a lot of uh, bioinformatical uh, methods being developed and mm -hmm. more all the time. Uh, and as like more and more in this hopefully moves into Julia, is the idea to try and gather all of like bioinformatics method that people develop under the BU Julia umbrella or it's more like certain standard stuff and when someone develops the method for doing some specific type of analysis, they have their own package. Uh, you will try to like gather all of this into one big group um, I don't know whether we would try and organize every single method under one big group. Um, partly because I just think it's a logistical nightmare. But um, a lot of the work that we've been doing actually is, um, for example, with um, working on the genomes, a lot of stuff is is actually very exploratory. So when we're investigating, like I say, analyzing simple and significant properties, 
there's normally not like a big tool that we run. There's some alignment and stuff, like the sort of stuff you'll already find in BioJulia, and then like exploratory analysis, like just, just plotting like a load of numbers that were output and this sort of thing. So it's not, I don't really see how we could try and capture it, all the methods that exist, but what we can do is pick the best data types and pick the best algorithms that exist and just go with that one and say, well, that's how we're doing it. Um, because you can't keep up with the literature of how many like software packages and things that get produced. And most of the time, on a, in a practical concept, in, in a practical setting, like, I don't know what, what you think of this, but in my experience, whichever tool I use to do an alignment, unless there's something seriously like that I need to consider that's serious about the nature of the data or whatever, it doesn't make a difference, really, whether I use one aligner to align reads to the genome or another, unless there's something about that data set where the method matters. Um, but most of the time, it doesn't make too much difference. Um, when I was doing um, population genetics and stuff, like a tree is a tree by and large. Most of the methods come out with similar stuff. And you just run a couple and then go, yeah, they agree. So um, I don't know how much it's worth putting in the effort to catalog everything. Um, uh, well, one thing I might not have um, re um, listened to there, um, but Scott, yesterday talking about strings, um, these genetic sequences mm -hmm. of strings. Have you actually defined a specific type? Because it's T TGAC, there's only four letters in the string, it's only four characters. Have you defined a specific type for genes? Yeah, no. that's, that's what the biosequence type does. Um, Sorry, I have So we have okay. um, basically a set of symbols that are basically primitive types that have um, sort of like a binary encoding. Um, then the, the sequence types themselves have some sort of data store, which is a vector or a chunk of bits. And then the alphabets determine, A, what the scope of the symbols that are allowed are. And with Julia's dispatch, they control how, those are in, how the bit patterns of those things are inserted into the data store. So um, I've got some plots I can show later of me like really speeding up loads of population genomics applications with this by 16 times 32 times. Um, because you can just do matches and mismatches and enumerate mutations between sequences really fast with bit shifting operations. It's crazy how fast that thing can go. Um, so yeah, we, we, we have our own types that are specialized to the fact that this is not a normal string. One of the <laughs> mottos of our group is DNA is not a random string. Um, and that's important. It's important. It's important for performance and it's important on philosophically as well when we're thinking about how to analyze genomes. It's, it's really important. Thank you. And if I can ask you just one quick question too. Um, to your knowledge, are there other ecosystems or in other languages, for example, that are um, you know, maybe trying to start developing some of what you've developed in, in BioJulia, which is to say, you know, replacing some of the command line messiness yeah. with? Um, I've seen the most recent bio project that I've seen in a new language would be probably by Rust, um, where they started up in Rust. And I don't know whether it has as much as we have in terms of the features and stuff, but it does have some that we don't, but we have no interest in implementing them. Um, but I think the programming difficulty with Rust for, for the biologist who is not anything more than a casual coder, because most biologists either come from a field or a lab and then they come in and they want to analyze their data and then they want to go back out again. They don't want to spend all the time on the computer. Um, I think that for them, Rust is a bit much, whereas Julia is not. Mm -hmm. um. Thank you.